You're listening to B2B Revenue Acceleration, a podcast dedicated to helping software executives stay on the cutting edge of sales and marketing in their industry. Let's get into the show. Hi, welcome to B2B Revenue Acceleration. My name is Aurélien Mottier, and I'm here today with Matt Leiborn, founder of Atroki, Rocky.io. How are you doing today, Matt? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me on. That's an absolute pleasure. So get it right. Rocky, Rocky.io, okay. all the time. I'm very malleable. You can call me what you like, but uh, yeah, we, we called Rocky. <laughs> we called Rocky, which is R O C K. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go with Rocky. So today we'll be talking about measuring content marketing success. But before we get started, it would be wonderful if you could introduce yourself to our audience, please, Matt. Yeah, I'm Matt, Matt Laybourne. So my background was previously in e-commerce. Um, so I was quite quite lucky like early on once I, I left uni to find an opportunity with someone who would let me sell things on the internet, basically, which was kind of a, a nice thing to do. But it taught me a lot of things around, you know, how performance works, what effective, effective marketing looks like, how to run a store, how to navigate websites and all those bits and pieces. So I got quite lucky in that respect. And then for some reason, I thought I'm going to, I'm going to spice up my life and move into B2B and the, where the, where the real big hitters are. I became a, a planner, a strategist at an agency in Reading that for six or seven years, eventually taking over the performance marketing teams there. So. Yeah, my, my background is very much in, I'm, I'm not a creative person, ironically, as we're going to talk about content today. So we'll see how that goes. But I'm not a, a traditionally creative person. I'm, I'm someone who really gravitates to like the metrics, the performance, what does effectiveness look like, and how can we get the most for our money? So I'm, I'm the kind of the boring data analyst guy to the fun, creative people over here who do the really good idea stuff. So <laughs> yeah, but we need um, people like yeah. you, Matt. We need, we need people like you. Unfortunately, without uh, data driven decision, it's difficult to move the needle. So yeah, and, and that's like, as you'll hear over the next sort of 20, 30 minutes, that's a lot of the driver of, of what, why we built Rocky and, and what we're trying to do with it is let's try and get some science behind the creativity. So tell me more about that. You know, what got you going with Rocky? You founded the business. So what, what was the, did you see anything in the market that was not done or what, what got you going? Yeah, it's been a strange journey because the idea initially started to form during lockdown when, you know, that, that kind of crazy period of time where we all had too much time on our hands, we're all sat in our houses wondering what's going on with the world. For some reason, my, my mind was gravitating toward content marketing. It was kind of a strange one because it's one of these processes where it, it's often the idea comes from something that frustrates you. You see a problem that isn't being solved by someone else at the moment in the market. My, my initial problem was I was actually interested in how we could increase conversion rate around content. What's a better way of doing it? And I, I kind of landed on this thought that from in e-commerce, we use social proof to drive conversion rate. It's, it's on every website. If you're buying a pair of trainers, there's a hundred reviews. If you're, you know, going to book a hotel on booking.com, I'm not being paid by them, by the way, but it's the first name I could think of. But if you're booking a hotel, there's a hundred reviews on that hotel and everything that's in it. And you're like, well, why is B2B so far behind with social proof? And that was kind of the initial idea. So I did a lot of research. And even at that time, way before chat GPT started dominating the headlines, there's a kind of a lowering in terms of the amount of trust that users have around B2B content, because we're at a weird point of saturation at the moment where everyone makes content now in B2B, absolutely everyone. And there's a lot of bad content being made as well, which is to try and manipulate a search engine, to try and manipulate a download for data purposes. And the people that are really good need to start standing out, need to kind of rise up above the rest of the crowd. So my initial thought was around that. And a lot of research I had was people saying, I don't trust vendor content as much because I know it's biased. I know it's trying to make yeah. me buy a thing. It's trying to make me download something that I might not necessarily want. And, you know, there's a whole gated content conversation to have another podcast probably but there was a kind of a big bias there that was was kicking in as well how do we put trust back into content and then i suppose the second part of it is i started speaking to content marketers and i said well what is what's good content what does that look like to you and the, you know there's a number of metrics that we're working with but i started to find every single person was different in terms of how they measure content you've got some are heavily seo led like i need volume i need search engine rankings I need uh, traffic, you know, whatever it may be. And there's other people who are demand gen teams are like, I need downloads. Downloads is the measure of success. Even though I don't even know if someone read the content. I know they filled out a form though. That's the measure of success. And you're like, right, 
this is crazy. And it's like, well, there's something missing here in the middle. Because the funny thing with all of those metrics are they are measures of the proxy of content. They're the measures of the things around content. They're measures of how good we are driving traffic or how good our conversion rate optimization is. None of that is reflective of content. And the, the purpose of content is to influence people, is to inspire people, is to you know get people excited about us, about a product, a service, an idea, a better way of doing something. And you're like, well, hang on, we haven't got a measure for that. We don't know how good content actually is. And I suppose that I don't even really, like this was a real soapbox moment, Ray. So I apologize, I've probably gone on for 10 minutes already, but this is kind of where it got to that really interesting point is, well, hang on, is, is there a better way of doing this? Is there a better understanding of what good content actually looks like and how we can put it back into our engine? So yeah, that's <laughs> a really long-winded way of saying that's good. Though. There, was, there was two problems that we found and we're like, okay, how do we go and solve them? What's the, what's the answer? So you, you've been coming back a few times to metrics, to what you should be looking at. You mentioned a piece that may be missing in the in the jigsaw in terms of, you know, uh, is it download? Is it how many people are actually doing this or that, whatever, SEOs and stuff like that. So I would say from a non-marketing perspective, conversion rate, keywords position, page views, how many likes, how many shares, how many downloads would be kind of my view of success. Am I missing anything? Is there anything that you would say, no, actually, you know what, this is, okay, these are great. Are they really qualitative? I mean, what's your perspective on all that? Because you mentioned metrics a few times, you mentioned a few yeah. things missing. What am I missing? If I'm missing any? <laughs> I mean, all, the, all those metrics are still valid. It's not, you know, I'm not here to say, oh, we should stop, ignore conversion rate and focus on the, you know, pure quality of the thing. It's all those things are still valid things that sit around the content piece itself. I suppose that the problem we actually found was this the measure we use mostly for measuring how good the content is itself. And it's, it's generally an analytics measure, which is like a dwell time on a page or a bounce rate on a page or exit rate of a page. And that's kind of fine. It's a good, again, a good proxy as to how well performing that content is. Like a high dwell time kind of indicates the majority of people that page have read most of the content. We don't really know how much. We don't know if they got distracted. We don't know what stage of the journey they were at and we don't we don't really know what they thought about the content so the biggest thing that we learned out of that whole mix was when we spoke to people is i look at that number i'll analyze it i'll share it with all my team and then we'll all guess as to what someone thought of that content and then we'll try and make content that looks like it and like when you're looking at a number in isolation like three minutes dwell time that doesn't tell me how to make better content or to influence my audience it, and it tells me how good a page is. So this is where we started to go with what's the best way of doing it. And, and our hypothesis and the working hypothesis now well beyond that is, well, we need to ask the audience. We need to actually speak to the people who are reading it and see what they think. So we've devised, it's quite a simple metric of, of doing it. We basically get a rating from that user, like how do you rate this content? Was it helpful? So between one and five. And then we chuck in a couple of options there just to help validate that that response is is exactly what we need. So we've got options there where users can kind of go, I want to ask the, I don't know, the job role of that person. Are they from finance, HR, IT? Are they a certain level of seniority? Are they, you know, high level or are they entry level? Whatever it may be. And then we're asking for a qualitative response as well. So this gives us a kind of a heat check, like, okay, HR loves our stuff. Well, we're not doing very well with ops teams. Why is that? And the qualitative then is giving us a bit of a response as to actually there's a consistent narrative we're seeing. I don't know, ops teams are always asking for more data, more examples, or there might even be a different tone of voice because, you know, we're talking in a very different language to a different type of cut target persona. So that's kind of where we got to with that. That's how we started working with, with Rocket at the moment to try and validate what is the measure of success. This is this yeah. is what we see as the middle metric, the middle measure that wasn't previously being collected. And and it's such a vast universe. You know, you could be targeting C level, B2B C level contact, or you could be targeting B2B technical people. You may have 20 people to target in one account versus one key person to target into an account. So, you know, it's like the brands that you would see in the B2B, you know, uh, those Rolex would do advertisement and content mm -hmm. versus, I don't know, you know, Casio probably have a very different way to go about things similar in some extent, but you know, also different, but you also mentioned something earlier on about gated and ungated content. <laughs> and I just wanted to come back to that because we just released some resources that I think have taken our team a fair amount of time to put together, like 
um, roughly four to six months, I believe. Uh, it's a collective effort, right? And it's says SDR and book, which has been very successful. We got, I mean, literally thousands of downloads, I believe, on it so far. And it's completely ungated. So we don't know who's downloading it. We don't know if they like it. We don't know, you know, we don't really get a lot of feedback. I, I have had a few feedbacks from people I know who told me I've mm -hmm. read it, I think it was good. But you mentioned the feedback, knowing if your content is actually eating the spot, which I really like. And we do that sort of thing that are engaged at the moment, which I think is also very good because it's good to give to the community. So mm. gated and gated, what, what are your thoughts on that? Okay. Topic as well, but what do you think about it? I said, Ray, I could do a podcast on gated versus ungated, but do you know what? It's been a fascinating journey because it, it's only, I think, in the last two years, this kind of anti-gated community starting to rise up. And when you start looking through the numbers of it, like I, I actually did some um, consultancy for another brand at the end of last year where we essentially look through their entire pipeline and we figured out they've kind of got two funnels playing side by side. You've got the marketing made funnel, which is where, you know, we, we put our paid media or, our, I don't know, content syndication, and we're forcing people to download this asset. And we're, we're kind of seeing, well, how, you know, hopefully they go through this journey that we've dictated that they go through where they, they read their three emails, the link score goes up and we ring them and then everyone's happy and they buy the thing. And that's just not how people behave anymore, if I'm honest. It was, it was probably very, it was effective five to 10 years ago. But the way things have changed, I think COVID accelerated that as well is some kind of numbers off the top of my head, but like Gartner and Forrester released reports in the last couple of years saying the number of touch points that people go on is now you know, 20, 30, 40 different touch points, different channels, different options. I can get that information from anywhere. And more and more of us want to self-serve all of our content. We want to go and find our own answers. We don't want it to be told to us by one brand on its own. So that's, there's a lot of changes in buyer behavior that are kind of saying the gated piece isn't as valuable anymore. And we've lost a little bit of trust in gated content because of perhaps kind of aggressive marketing and sales tactics around it. So if I go and put my name into any gated thing, I know for a fact, I don't know, give it 10 minutes, I'll have an email. I might have a phone call from someone and they're going, have you read the ebook? I'm like, no, I haven't read the ebook yet. <laughs> I'm not ready well, yet. 70 pages, I've done it eight five minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, I'm a reasonably quick reader, but give me a little bit more time. Um, and we're, tr we're treating it as a transactional, like, well, they've, they've said they're interested. We're not, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually just researching at this point. So there's kind of a drop off in conversion rate on those types of assets. And I think as well that, well, it's going back to that example of the company I did some work with, I started to figure out that their gated funnel converted at something like three or four percent into opportunities at the very bottom of the funnel. Their ungated funnel, people who are just coming onto the website and reading, you know, the blogs, infographics, the ungated assets, they're converting at 16, 70 percent to opportunity once they, they kind of go through a book of demo form. You're talking the same volumes of people, but one of them more likely to work with you than the other by a huge, you know, statistically huge difference in the two and it just says well we've got we've got to change our behavior now like just trying to force people to give away their information it's just not as effective as it used to be we've got to trust that we are the thought leaders and we are the experts and i, I know the handbook that you guys released and it's like well this positions us as the authority in the marketplace we've got to go and trust that content and get it out there and there's different mechanisms we can how we to measure that but we're in an evolving marketplace well what is what a good measurement of that type of asset look like and there's still things there to be determined i think i don't think no one's cracked it yet for example but i think it's a case of actually trusting that we've got some good stuff and instead of having an audience of you know 15 people who downloaded it i could have an audience of a thousand and i'm hoping if that content's as good as it is a thousand people are going to enjoy it rather than just those 15. So yeah, yeah. it's funny one. <laughs> uh, you know, coming back to the metrics, you, know, you mentioned like probably having a rating the content one to five. I mean, from my perspective, inbound is critical. We've got to create good content. We need to make sure the content makes sense, reaching the right audience. So, you know, to really get the conversion. So do you have any practical example of how you measure those metrics? So you already gave a couple, but if we were to to bring it back to tactical things that you do to make sure that the content is delivered to the right people, the content makes sense for those people. You kind of know what to invest in moving forward mm. in creating content. So practical example would be super useful of, of how you do it because it's actually, it does make sense, but it's, you've got the spray and pray approach from lots of vendors. You've got the usual, let's pick to Gartner and give them a bit of money so we can get a report with them and stuff like that. But actually people who are creating their own sort leadership content that reach the right targets, eat the right nerves. It's not easy. 
Yeah, there's a good example I can show you on that. So we signed up a beta user because, I mean, Rocky's reasonably in its infancy still. We've, we're not even a year old yet. We've gone through a process of like, you know, validating the idea, building an MVP, and essentially bringing on beta users to go, you know, how does this work? How are you going to use it? What's valuable and what isn't? One of our biggest beta users has now got to like over 1,000 ratings, different bits of feedback as well. So they've got this huge treasure chest of, of data that, they didn't have on their content before because it was just a blog. And it's, it's a very like high-performing blog, huge traffic volumes, very good for SEO, very good performing blog in that respect. But they've never really understood the why behind that. It's, okay, this is useful. What do we do now with it? So we were able to sit down with them in the last couple of weeks and go, well, actually, there's trends emerging in just the ratings alone. And this is something you can start to use to optimize your content. So a, a really good example was... Your content really resonates at mid-market level, mid in terms of seniority. So managers, heads of department, people who are kind of experts in, in that specialist field, they're always ranking your content really well. They're giving it four or five out of five on a regular basis. However, C-suite, director level, are always ranking it lower. They're actually ranking it around three marks. So this actually is solving a problem they didn't realize they had because they... We always hypothesize in the organization, this content's too, it's too high level, people won't get it. Or this one's too low level, it's too basic. They've actually got a measure now to go, do you know what? It was too low level. We're, we're actually not, we're not being, you know, as smart as we could be with our audience. We could be putting more technical stuff. We could be raising it up a notch, for example. So it's given them a steer to go back to their creative team. And not only that, they've got qualitative responses as well, where people have said, this was great but you need to give me more examples or more sources of why you've made that statement. And it's now going into their creative team to go, well, actually, let's try and rewrite some of this to make it work better. So the, the theory is there, at least I can optimize against better metrics like an engagement rate and engagement time with our target customer audience. So yeah, that's one level of influence. But equally, when you're starting to really nail those bits of content, you're getting consistently high rankings, you're getting good ratings and things. So you've got a nice benchmark emerging. What we're trying to encourage users to do as well is to start leverage that data as social proof. So if 10 people in the C-suite have said, this, I don't know, this ebook is absolutely incredible, yeah, put it on your website and have a little badge going, you know, people like you are loving this content. And we're in a, we're in a marketplace now where everyone is creating content. We're saturated. Absolutely. So quality needs to stand out. And if you can leverage so social proof from people who said, I think this was a really valuable asset, absolutely leverage it. And that is how you can hopefully as well drive up the conversion rates as well, which is something B2B is notoriously like kind of behind the trends with B2C on. So yeah, there's a, there's a couple of angles there and it's really exciting seeing that uh, that B2 user start to put it into practice now. It was kind of a real like light bulb moment where we're like, oh my God, this is actually working. It's actually uh, helping someone out. So yeah. It was a relief, actually, more than a light bulb. <laughs> yeah, it's good. But I want to come back to social proof because I think it's such an interesting topic. I mean, for me, social proof is the is bringing the way I buy my stuff from Amazon into the business world. And I actually do the same. When we've got a decision, we go and check. Okay, But I want to come back to that. You're quite big on the first point, which is, the, I would say, almost the scoring of your content. Like, how do you score and evaluate? So tell me a little bit more about the tools that can be used to do so and, and the method that you've seen being successful to evaluate at, at scale. Because I think we've done it. And sometimes our B2B prospects are a bit cheeky because they take your content. And, you know, what I hate to do is you want to download that content. All right. You've got to tell me this, that, that. Give me the color of your pants. Give me the color, you know, what you did <laughs> yesterday. You know, you just got to give it to them at some point. So we used to only take the email address, but then people are a bit reticent with that. Exactly. As you said, because I'm already receiving thousands of emails. So then you end gate. But God, we would be good to say, look, I'm going to give you the content for free. Don't mm -hmm. even know your email address, but please take five minutes to do a feedback form. But my problem with that is that we don't really get the response right, we hope. So mm -hmm. we can't really have enough data to really, you know, in my eyes, you need to have hundreds of lines of data to be able to make a generality. So I wanted to bring that with you in, in terms of the scoring and at scale, if there is any tools that you've been using, any techniques that you've been using to get those prospects to actually say, you know what, you've been good to me, so I'm going to give you at least five minutes feedback. So I help you move the needle even forward. We sometimes struggle to get that. And then I'd like to know how you do your scoring. Yeah, that is a problem. Is like to use this data in the right way, you do have to have a level of significance with it. If you're just basing it off of one or two 
scores alone, is that enough to go and optimize a piece of content? That, that creates a whole work stream, which probably isn't quite validated just yet. So there's definitely different ways of looking at it. So it's a really simple methodology. You can start, you can even use something like, like a hot jar. There's other kind of survey tools that you can start to put onto sites and stuff like that. And obviously Rock is another example in that case. But regardless, Regardless of what the tool is, at this point, it's got to be a really, really clear hypothesis as to what you're trying to achieve with that information and what is the minimum number of steps that you can go and get that information within. So with the, quite, there's probably a million and one articles out there about the, you know, the psychology of how long a form field thing is on a gated asset or on a contact form. And you take away another two fields and your conversion rate goes up 20, 30%. And there's a lot of truth in it. And it, sometimes there's really silly things there. You look at those forms and you go, do you really need to know, like for example, like the location of where that business is? Or could you not just Google it yourself or ask them when you get on an onboarding call? Like, why are you risking annoying someone to get pieces of information which you can just go and find out yourself yeah. or validate with an introduction call? So like less is always more in those scenarios. You don't want to put doubt into people's minds to kind of tag in social proof here as well. But when you've got those contact forms, you need to have social proof all around it. There's, there kind of only needs to be a single call to action, which is fill out this form. But just reminding people, trust us, you know, we're, we're rated high on G2. We're a trust pilot, you know, one of the best rated in our area, whatever it may be, you just need to give people that confidence that what they're doing is a good decision and they're going to have a good experience on the next stage. But yeah, like without going into every single tool that's out there, less is always more. Make sure what you're getting is genuinely valuable and necessary for your business. And if you're doing surveying, not just contact form collection, and you're trying to find, you're trying to solve a specific problem, whether it's around the quality of content or website experience. It really is just worth checking in with someone who's an expert in that space, finding those expert pieces of content and going, well, what is kind of the bare minimum I need to validate that hypothesis? So yeah, start with a good hypothesis and work your way back in the, the simplest ways is my advice mm. in that respect. Yeah, it's a good point. In that. One thing that we are thinking of doing, I'd like to get your opinion on it. We just recruited a, a community manager, so someone that can help us to help with our community. And you know, our community are not just clients. We have ex-clients. We've got people that have been prospect forever and they've all bought things, but they always come to our events. We have partners, but these are all sales, marketing professional, or what I would call a, a, a P&L holder. So it could be the CEO in a small company, it could be a VP, MEA in a relatively medium-sized medium company, it could be a country manager in, in a very large one, but in our B2B software space, which is which is where we specialize. And we are almost like, a, like an avant-première, you know, sharing the content with that group of people and say, hey, what do you think of it? Do you think that's ready to hit the market? Is it mm -hmm. actually... So almost using the community of trusted, but you know, we trust them, but lots of them are still quite cynical professional and they will tell you that your baby is ugly. If they see that your baby is not is ugly, <laughs> <laughs> you still, you still get a, I'm not talking about like a fan base. We're talking about people that are also professional that, you know, probably try to make the industry a little bit better and try to make everything we do a little bit better. So we, we're actually trying to get it done prior to eating Okay, that's really is as a, almost like a, it's not a non-executive board, but a, like a sounding board, should I say, like a sounding mm -hmm. board to, to see what they think about the content, to see how they rate it, to see if it's really accurate for them. And we believe that, you know, sometimes we've, we've not done it yet, but we believe that people may say, hey, you know what, in that chapter, you should really tackle that. I was frustrated that you mentioned it, but then you don't actually develop on it because I think that's a real issue. So we're expecting people to actually help us to get better, which may be, never ending because i think you can't content create for everyone specifically completely tailored completely personalized but yeah, what are your thoughts on that to kind of go to the sounding board first if you if you manage to get enough people in the right personnel that could be in your group in your community to, to check basically before you press go before you press send to the rest of the world i think it's an incredible idea i think the problem you're actually solving a problem that so many B2B organizations have is it's so easy to get stuck in our kind of tunnel vision. What's happening in our organization is, you know, the most important thing in the world. So whatever we say is right. And for all the best strategy, planning, audience research and things, you might end up coming out with a view, which actually it tends to be quite brand centric and it doesn't kind of incorporate 
the challenges that people are seeing around you, as much as we get anecdotal evidence from lots of different people. And th there's always huge bias in what we create. We can't help it. It's because it's the thing we care about, the thing we love, the business that we've built. So you do need to inject at different stages of, of your content process feedback from people who do not have that kind of fan base. <laughs> you, you can put it nicely there, but like like the fan base, if, if they've already got a bias, it's trying nice to get a bit of individual perspective on it as well and take that subjectivity out of it. But if you can mm -hmm. find people and, and get them to, you know, you have a, a really nice structured list of questions where you go, no, I'm not going to be offended if you say, do you know what, you're wrong. I want you to tell me I'm wrong because if you just tell me everything's great and the campaign fails, I'm going to wonder why. Yeah. I, need you, I need you to tell me why it's wrong or something's missing because that's the only way I get better. It's the same with so many different areas. But yeah, if you can find some good people who are happy to, to give you that honest answer, that's a huge weapon in your arsenal at the beginning of a process. Really good feedback. Is this is the right message. Is it going to the right audience? Is this having the right impact? That's incredible. But equally, backing that up as well at the end of the process, from the you know once you've launched it, keep getting that feedback because that is all ammunition to optimize, to adapt the next piece of content. It might even inspire the next campaign as well because you've got your finger on the pulse. You you know what people are looking for in the market. So yeah, community manager is incredible for that. And they can pick up a lot from social too without um, going on a whole social thing there, but there's a lot of opportunity there to get feedback. Well, we, 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 we'll get further in that trait and let you know what we get to. I mean, I think the, the concept seems to be uh, interesting, but, but coming back to social proof, again, you know, tactical. So you mentioned like, uh, how would you create that badge about good content? Have you seen anything quite cool with people ranking their content on their website or actually being very honest and saying, look, this is a really good piece of content for CMOs? Because I'm thinking if you've got that information, you could almost reorganize your content and create a library that is pretty cool. So yeah, social proof. And I think social proof is, is everything. You know, the, It's much easier for me to buy your services, Matt, if my good friend who is a successful businessman is using your services very successfully. Right. Mm. My due diligence done. I'll trust him. If he trusts you, it's easy. Okay. But also, if I don't have a friend that knows you and I looked at your review and there is lots of people that seems to be at my level or whatever that loves you, again, versus your competitors, it's always the same things. How many five stars review you've got? You know, and then what's the thing? Because you may have someone who's like a four out of five star, but out of 20,000 review. And you've got mm -hmm. someone who is a five star out of 20 reviews, we could be his mate and his family. So yeah, I'd like you to develop a little bit, you know, high level strategy around social proof. How do you go about it with your clients? Well, where to start if you don't do it yet? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a really good ending question there. <laughs> like it, it's an interesting one because so, so, social proof online and particularly in B2C first of all, and B2B is playing catch up now. It is an extension of what you just said there, which is referrals, it's word of mouth. Word of mouth, like you look at any marketing report over the last, I don't know, 100 years, what's the most valuable thing you can do in marketing? Word of mouth, a referral. Those people tend to go close at a higher level of opportunity than anything else we can do around it. And everything else we're trying to do around it, we're trying to inject proof into it anyway <laughs> that isn't quite as strong as word of mouth. But the first thing you can do is figure out where you can start collecting data. So B2B it is significantly harder than B2C. B2C has the benefit of volume. So if I sell trainers on a website, I'm going to get, I don't know, I might sell 500 pairs a day. That's perfect. That's huge volume that I can work with. But if I'm a B2B software company, I might only sell one product a day or one product a week, depending how big the size of the deal is. So the, the first thing to do is to gravitate towards those vendor sites, like people like G2, people like the Gartner Peer Insights. And that is the, the number one starting point for social proof. So if you've got a high value product, start getting reviews from those happy customers. You also want to catch them at that moment where the experience is at its best, whether they've just completed onboarding or they've just, you know, they've just completed the sign up process. Everything's gone yeah. really well. You want to be collecting that type of data. So the, the data itself is valuable, but representing it and repackaging it is the next most valuable thing you can do. And that's where that needs to sit on your homepage. So there's, there's really good tools. Like, I mean, traditionally B2B just puts logos on there 
And the first question is, do they really work with that company? I mean, I, I assume they have. They put the logo there and I, hopefully they're good, honest people. But there's a level of scrutiny that's probably increasing. So there's, there's tools there you can kind of, you can drop the G2 stuff in, for example, and link back to your G2 pages. But yeah, drop that on your homepage. So show proof, show your, your ideal customer profile that you work with people who look like them already. Like the traditional case study is still valuable, but it is not something people were actively looking for. I'm just looking for signals at this point. And then the next most valuable thing you can do is start to inject proof away from that hero page, but in other key pages of the journey. So if you're starting to collect ratings on your content with something like Rocky, but we didn't 100% encourage that because if you can go look, five people in the C-suite have said this was an incredible piece of content. Cool, you're, in, you're building trust. And, and trust does two things. It gives you two metrics, which you really need. One is engagement. Okay, I have the confidence to read and engage with that piece of content and, in, and go a little bit further. And hopefully the second one is it was influential. It did the job that the content was supposed to do and it's driven me onto conversion. And then those conversion pages, again, you've just got your G2 stuff again there as well. So like the strategy doesn't have to be complicated, but the first step is go and get that data and then work out where you want that on the customer journey. Yeah. Last question for me, probably a tough one. Is there any medium that you think is the best for B2B buyers? We've heard about, obviously, the classic content of writing an article, writing a blog post, writing an ebook. There is what we are doing right now, which I would say is more like the audio, but probably also use it on video, YouTube and stuff like that. But it's kind of the longer type of content and it's probably more like a slow burner. Mm. You just mentioned like the, the, the case studies that can be done via videos, actually having your customers speaking. And it's interesting because sometimes you go to website, the first thing you see is like customers speaking about us, you know, it's like, oh, we work so hard to get that, that you, we want you to see it. And I'm sure they're all different from part of the buying journey. As you're saying, some people want sig signal. I got my signals, I'm down to three vendors. Now I need social proof and we've also got the most lovers. I will go for whatever. So I'm, I'm sure it's a very complex question for you to answer, but do you see any of this medium use a different part of the process, actually driving more results with video drive more results than text, for example, or is it just like a story that we are being told by people who sell videos? <laughs> There's always a vendor who says their medium and platform is the better than everyone else's. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things that do consistently stand out. And I think with this one, sometimes you have to ask yourself, when I've bought something in B2B, what do I gravitate towards? Like, where's most of my influence come from? Something that I, I found really interesting, because I, I think, again, during the pandemic, podcasting just came out of nowhere. And it's huge for brand authority and credibility. If you've got these all informal conversations, you're constantly bringing expertise, you're talking around subjects, it, really, it actually builds quite a lot of brand value and brand sentiment. So I've got like two or three brands that I'm I'm kind of addicted to like they've become a media company and i'm like oh, i can't wait to listen to the new <laughs> listen to the new podcast and you're like well that's that's kind of a strange behavior that we didn't have in being to be before so that a very top top of funnel brand yeah. awareness thing they're incredibly valuable they're desperately hard to measure because again we just look at numbers of subscribers and things like that but the amount of people that you anecdotally go i heard you had thingy on i had you had x on you actually all start to resonate so like that format it takes time the podcast it sorry to interrupt you but we yeah, started yeah. the podcast because i could not be bothered to write a blog post that would take me because i ate it so it would take me a day two days to actually get to something i, I like but don't like and then you leave it to the wild press send on linkedin and you literally got three likes yeah. And you kind of give your heart and soul to something. And it's just like so difficult to create content when you don't really have, you know, I'm talking about the company that when we started, we didn't have the funding. And we didn't have VC, we didn't have PEs. We, it was our own money. It was us getting going, you know, very blood, sweat and tears. Of course, when you've got the ability to be able to recruit people or the ability to get agencies to support you, that's fantastic. But creating content can be so difficult. And mm -hmm. we started the podcast because the podcast, look, we have a conversation. We're going to be on Intune, Spotify potentially YouTube, so that's already three medium technically. We can then take the text and do some blog posts. We can then push it on LinkedIn. You've got LinkedIn, so you can be a bit viral with your followers and the people that like what you're doing. And it's a nice way. You have a good conversation. It takes you an hour to have a good conversation with someone. You learn a ton. It may actually help you to change your business. So there's also that sort of gross mindset journey going mm. on. 
And we loved it. But for us, actually help us to bring more clients. Do we have a real traction? As you say, probably not. And then you look at social. Well, people come to us and say, I looked at your G2 and your G2 is much better than all the other guys in the industry. I look at your clutch and yeah, you've got two of three of my ex-colleagues. I just mentioned that you're a fantastic company to work with. So I want to engage with you guys. If some of them seems to be more direct than other, we are yet someone to, and maybe that's going to be the thing. I'm going to get a call in a month and say, look, I listen to your podcast with Matt and wow. Yes, maybe you're going to be the guy, guy, you know, but sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to mention that about the podcast in particular. It's a long burner, but I think it's such an enjoyable experience in the long term. The mm -hmm. things you learn from it, the content you can create from it, but then the content kind of get disassociated with the podcast itself because then you, you've got all those pieces that become independent from each other. So yeah, difficult to track, but definitely valuable. It's, the thing is that there's, there's, there's a couple of things that come off the back of that. One is you it's just hit the nail on the head. It's your exposure is 10 times more than a, probably more than that. It might be 50 times more than a blog post. The blog post might, depending on how well your SEO performs, you might get, you know, 15 readers a month. But because you've just gone social, you've gone out into the blog as well, you've gone into, it might even gone into emails, you've increased your audience size massively. So your ability to influence and engage people has just increased uh, like a huge, huge amount there. And then the other thing as well with it as well is a lot of people are experimenting with um, like self-reported attribution on their websites. So more and more people have gone back to open text fields of how did you hear about this? And that tends to get the, um, oh, actually, I've listened to your podcast for six months. And you're like, oh, I wouldn't have known that because at the moment, most websites just track last touch. And it's like, well, you just said you came from Google. It's like, well, Google yeah. just, that Google yeah. just the thing I clicked on to get here. But I've listened to you for six months and you're like, oh, it is working. It is having an influence. So I suppose back to the, the question, yeah, that podcasting like, is, is a great way of just distributing things into lots of different things. And the next thing I was going to say on that is, is video is still hugely impactful, particularly in B2B where people just go, I just want to see. Yeah. what the thing is you do particularly software just show me what the software is do a nice video i don't need the marketing flashy like i don't know all, all this kind of spiel i don't need yeah. the we're the innovators in global digital transformation come on show me the platform yeah, you can do shit. <laughs> tell me what makes you special and yeah. uh, let's see what's the value for me what's in it for me uh, that's what we call the what's in it for me content and trying to do videos of the what's in it for me can be difficult but you have to do bite size but we've got some plans to invest on that but we've got some of our clients that do it are doing it very very well and you've got new platform as well i mean do you do you see b2b companies using tiktok properly for example you know or instagram properly or facebook for business i mean who use facebook anymore anyway but instagram and tiktok is probably where probably a very vast percentage of the world population spending their a lot of time on but i don't see a lot of b2b brand actually using you know, being present and you mm. could, you know, TikTok is so many people well, when I don't know TikTok, but I ask the people around me who have TikTok, I say, well, what do you do? Do you dance or, cause you see for me as people dancing, I don't have TikTok on my phone. And when they tell me, say, no, I don't post really any content, but I follow people. And if I want to paint the wall and I want to paint it pink, I can do a search and see what to do to prepare mm. my wall. And there is lots of tutorials. So it's kind of becoming almost like a YouTube. I would go to YouTube for that. And I think it could be good for brands to say, look, this is how you do it, right? It's just giving, almost training people to show them what's the right thing to do when there is no other real platform in the world to know how those things are being done. You know, you and I were talking about tattoos just before the thing today. I spoke to a tattoo artist yesterday and he told me, look, you know, when I started tattooing, like literally to learn to know it 10 years ago, you had to find a guy that will let you come to his shop, take you under his wing and trust you enough to put some ink on one of his clients. And that's tough. Now that you've got pec skin that they can train on, like porous latex. Mm. There is TikTok videos that say, oh, if you want to do shading, this is how you do shading. If you want to do the Japanese style, this is how you do that. Fine line, this is how you choose your needle and this is how you prepare your stuff. So look, the content is immense and actually, it's much easier to get to know it. But I think it should be the same in sales and marketing. I think it should be the same in software. And, and I, I, I think it's underused, but I don't know what would be your thoughts on that. And, and maybe because the audience is not on it, I don't know. It's a really interesting one because there was a big push at the end of last year where there was a couple of like big B2B brands who really went for it on TikTok. And I haven't heard much from them since. So I don't quite know how well it went, but they were kind of talking about the benefits of it. I mean, you can get, for example, you can get a, really good exposure 
on TikTok a lot quicker as well. There's there's definitely opportunity to reach more people. Whether it's the right people is you could argue is a different question. But the, the other interesting thing you like touched on there is is like the freedom of like knowledge and expertise now. And it used to be such a thing that we hide. Trust us, contact us, and we'll tell you how good we are. But we're not going to tell you in advance. Like this kind of like oh, we're, we're not going to give away all our secrets to you. But I think, again, I think the strongest people will actually go, well, this is why we're so good. Come yeah. and work with it. We'll do it for you. Because the reality is most people aren't going to go, I'm going to go and completely set up a whole company based on the YouTube tutorials of this company. I'm going to go and work. I'm just going to go and ask them to come and work for me yeah. because they've shown me how good they are. So it can go like, we well, you know we're going full circle here, but that whole gated content thing is like, well, it's dead. It's, it's a dead yeah. thing. It's like, if, if you're really the expert, tell me. I haven't got the time or the energy to go and figure it out going through lots of marketing bump, filling out forms, tell me on the platform I want it to be on and we'll figure out. I think t- TikTok will emerge. People will crack it at some point. Mm, I haven't I think, quite seen it yet. And, and you made a good point. The real reason I think probably people or B2B software companies may not be as active on TikTok is probably because they think, look, would I have the CIO of uh, one of the FTSE 250 companies spending his evening while he's watching Love Island checking his TikTok, right? Likelihood of that is probably very, very low. However, what I think is great with Reels and TikTok is the ability to edit videos and do short content that can potentially be reused on LinkedIn, that can potentially be reused in other way when you engage with people, because you didn't really have the ability to edit stuff too easily, you know, before that. And I think that that's what kind of intrigued me because, and also we need to think about the next generation of buyers. You know, we don't want to get stuck with what we are doing and just thinking, oh yeah, you know what? My dad used to do that and he was working. His dad used to do it and he was working. And, you know, so so let's carry on. So I, th- I think we've got to also evolve, but it seems like the small bite size, ungated, useful content that gives yeah. me information that actually helped me to make my decision a little bit better or Help me to reframe and challenge what I was thinking about the potential solution. Could be a nice way to actually create this light bulb moment that you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. So something to discuss and maybe, you know, let, let's get together in a, in a few years <laughs> when we both have a million TikTok followers and <laughs> see what happens next. But um, uh, thank you so much for your insight, Matt, today. It was super useful to have you here. I've got so many more questions that I would like to ask you, but if any of our audience want to reach out to you or start to work with Rocky or try want to find out about how Rocky could help them to grow their business, to make their content better, basically to do all the stuff we discussed today, to generate more inbounds and make their content marketing more accountable, what's the best way to get hold of you, Matt? Yeah, two channels. Look me up on LinkedIn, Matt Laybourne. It's L-A-Y-B-O-U-R-N. I'm often moaning about all things b2b or just being slightly cynical but don't let that put you off i'd love to connect with you <laughs> drop me a message that'd be cool and yeah rocky the website is uh, r-o-c-k-e dot io if you wanted to find out more about the platform well if you're cynical and you like to moan about everything i'm, I'm gonna make sure that i get you didn't say moaning i don't know why i'm saying that it come across as you know sometimes when you voice your opinion well, when you are very honest about what you think i'm gonna make sure that i get my community manager to reach out to you. So when we create the next piece of content and we've got that sort of sounding board, we can get your opinion on what we're doing. <laughs> and I, I get yeah. the other voice of reason. Yeah, there's no point being around the bush. It's, uh, let's just be honest with each other. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was great to have you, Matt, today. A pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to B2B Revenue Acceleration. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.